Hello, and welcome to this EFS webinar about the EFS user guide, including application interpretation of the EFS products and services. First, we'll talk about the EFS background, then we'll talk about EFS products and services, the benefits of probabilistic forecasting, detecting and analyzing a flood signal in EFS, and then finally, we'll wrap up with some EFS partner benefits. The Copernicus Emergency Management Service, or SEMS, provides critical geospatial data and images to support disaster management. And SEMS also provides monitoring for signals and evidence of impending and ongoing disasters. The European Flood Awareness System, or EFAS, is one of these different types of early warning systems. And it provides a pan-European flood forecasting and monitoring system to complement national and regional systems. EFAS also provides medium range transnational probabilistic forecasts. SEMS provides lots of comprehensive information online in the SEMS floods wiki. This provides information on the SEMS flood products and services. The EFAS wiki is part of the SEMS flood wiki and it provides information regarding the technical components of the EFAS system, including descriptions of the model configuration, products, and versions. Then we have the SEMS Flood Data User Guide, which provides technical information concerning the availability of data and how to access and work with the data. Finally, we have the EFAS User Guide, which we'll focus on today. And this provides general information on the EFAS products and services for both first-time users and for those who want to learn more about the available services and data. The easiest way to access the EFAS User Guide and the EFAS Wiki is directly within the EFAS IS user interface. At the top here, by the button for the map viewer, there are also buttons for the user guide and the wiki. Alternatively, you can scan this QR code or go to the link below. The EFS user guide consists of several different parts. First, there's the user community, then there's the products overview, the EFS IS interface, the hands-on guide, resources, and contributing to EFS. In this webinar, we will focus on the products overview, the EFS IS interface, and the hands-on guide. The EFS product portfolio includes forecasts of large-scale riverine floods and flash floods with computed hazard and impact predictions. It also provides near real-time monitoring and mapping of the European hydrological situation and associated impact estimations. The product portfolio includes medium range forecasts, flash flood indicators, sub-seasonal and seasonal outlooks, and the global flood monitoring tools. EFS partners can access the medium range forecasts and flash flood indicators in real time. However, for all others, there's a 30 day delay in access to these products. With the sub-seasonal and seasonal outlooks, these are available for both partners and all others as soon as they're issued. Finally, the global flood monitoring tools are available now in the EFAS IS map viewer for all EFAS partners. However, for all others, these features will be released soon, but they're available now in the GLOFAS web viewer. First, we'll talk about the medium range forecasts. These provide an overview of upcoming flood events and impacts used to send notifications to EFAS partners for predicted flooding. And these are created by comparing forecast simulations with flood threshold levels. For each of these slides, I'll have a little box in the bottom that shows the lead time when they're updated and some EFS IS layers that you can look back at if you're interested in these products. For flash flood forecasts, these provide the flash flood occurrence probability and they're used to send notifications to the EFS partners for predicted flooding. These are generated by comparing runoff forecasted by numerical weather prediction systems to reference thresholds. We also have the ERICA indicators for flash flooding, and these identify the flash flood hazard for very localized events that are difficult to predict with the other numerical weather prediction systems. These are generated from radar-based precipitation monitoring and now casting. We also have the sub-seasonal and seasonal outlooks. The sub-seasonal to seasonal and seasonal outlooks for hydrological extremes provide data on the high and low flows. These support applications such as reservoir management, navigation, irrigation, and drought risk management. 
Finally, we have the global flood monitoring. This provides continuous global monitoring of flood events and delivers satellite-derived water and flood extent information in near real time. And this is within eight hours approximately of the image acquisition. The global flood monitoring products are available within the EFAS IS map viewer. For EFAS partners, these are available now, and you can access them. For all others, these will be accessible soon in the EFAS IS map viewer. Now we'll talk about the benefits of probabilistic forecasting. EFAS uses forecast ensembles to improve the robustness of the system by providing multiple precipitation inputs to the hydrological model. These forecast ensembles are designed to capture a large variety of possibilities. We start with the same initial conditions, and then it grows into the different possible evolution scenarios. With these, the errors grow over time and then extreme events may be only captured by one or a few different members. But they're really useful in, for early warning when weather forecasts are the most uncertain, between 3 to 15 days before an event occurs. How does deterministic forecasting compare to probabilistic forecasting? Well, the deterministic forecasts are produced by a single forecast, whereas probabilistic forecasts are produced from ensembles of forecast. With a deterministic forecast, we'll provide one value for a single location in a time. For example, we could say with a deterministic forecast that the peak discharge will be exactly 738 cubic meters per second and occur at 425. With a probabilistic forecast, we get this range of values provided for a location in time, so that there's a 75% chance that the peak discharge will exceed 700 cubic meters per second and occur sometime between 15 and 1730. So the problem with deterministic forecasts is that they don't provide any kind of information on the degree of certainty. If we say it's going to rain exactly this amount, or the discharge will be exactly this amount at this exact time, the odds of that happening and being exactly that value are pretty low. But with the probabilistic forecast, because it's a likelihood based, then it shows this likelihood that a parameter is going to exceed a threshold or occur in a given area. Another important thing is how the EFAS thresholds are computed. So we have this evolution scenario here with a different forecast ensemble. Really, for EFAS, the discharge magnitude is less important than if the discharge exceeds a critical threshold. So if this is the threshold discharge for flooding, and these are the different ensemble predicted forecasts, then we're probably not going to have a problem with flooding because all of the forecasted discharges are below this threshold. If, alternatively, this is our threshold, then maybe we'll have a problem because some of the ensemble members are starting to exceed this threshold. Or if this is our threshold for flooding, then we're most likely going to have a problem with flooding because all of the ensemble members are above this threshold. How do we establish these kind of critical levels? Well, at national institutions, this is often linked to local phenomenon, like a bridge is being overtopped or a road becomes flooded or the river is at a bankful condition. But for EFAS, it's a continental scale system, and this kind of information isn't available in a standardized format for an entire continental level. So we have to derive these thresholds differently. This is how we do it in EFAS. First, we take meteorological observations for a historical period, and we use that to run the LISFUD model in EFAS. Then we get simulated discharge time series, and from these we can compute the return period statistics. And these are used for the EFAS thresholds. You have the two-year, the five-year, and the 20-year return period thresholds. And then these thresholds are individually calculated for each of the modeled growth cells. Now we'll talk about how to analyze a flood signal in EFAS. The first step is to find an event of interest or an area of interest. If you're an EFAS partner, this may be because you received an EFAS flood notification or an EFAS flash flood notification. So with this, you can log into the EFAS IS map viewer and select a date and time of interest. And then you can zoom to the desired area, or you can use the active notifications layer to find a specific event. And if you click on the notification, then you can zoom to that area. If you're not an EFAS partner, then maybe you want to look for flooding in an area that you know already flooded. So then you can go select the date and time of interest, zoom to that area of your interest, 
And then you can turn on the reporting points layers and search for reporting points in that area. One of the first things you might want to do when analyzing a flood signal is to analyze the initial conditions. So this is the, we have layers for the soil moisture anomaly and also observed precipitation. And the goal here is to identify if the conditions are susceptible to flooding. So if the soil moisture is highly wetter than normal, then it might be more susceptible for flooding. The same with the precipitation. If there's lots of observed precipitation before an event, then it might be more susceptible to flooding. Another thing you can do is inspect the catchment properties. So in EFAS, we use the list flood model, and different reservoirs and lakes are modeled. If you know there's a lake reservoir in your area, it'd be good to check these are included in the EFAS model because any unmodeled water bodies may affect the accuracy of the EFAS predictions. You're the expert in your catchment. If you know there's a large reservoir, but it's not in the list flood model used by EFAS, then you might want to be cautious of the EFAS predictions. Now that we've done these due diligence items, we can now examine the hydrograph. With reporting points, the hydrographs show the forecasted discharge and the corresponding return period. If you look at the plots, you can also see the timing of peaks, the magnitude of the peaks, and the severity or the, the exceeded critical threshold. There's also this overview table that shows the highest threshold exceeded, the discharge tendency, and the percentage of the ensemble members above threshold. So the goal with analyzing this hydrograph is to determine the magnitude, timing, and probability of the predicted flooding. For flash flooding, we have the ERIC reporting points, and these show the hydrograph with the return period probability distribution for all ensemble members. So it's good to point out here that this isn't showing the individual time series of the different ensemble members, but we calculated an error corrected probability distribution, and then that probability distribution is what's shown here. So the solid dark black line, that's the ensemble mean, and then the 30th and 70th percent quantiles are also shown. And then the blue shading shows the probability distribution, with the median being in the darkest blue in the middle, and then subsequent quantiles have lighter blues. The goal here is to determine the timing, magnitude, and exceedance probability of flooding. You might also want to check the model performance for an area. We have several different model performance layers, which summarize the model performance for all the gauges where the model was calibrated. We have speedometer figures here to show model performance metrics, and also time series and climatology figures to identify periods where the model performance may be lower. The goal here is to assess your trust in the model performance. Related to that, we might also want to assess the forecast skill. In EFS, we use a persistence benchmark forecast, which assumes that the future conditions will be the same as the present conditions. So what this means is that if it's 10 degrees of raining today, then the persistence forecast will assume that it'll be 10 degrees of raining tomorrow. This is a naive method, and in the future, we may reassess how we evaluate the forecast skill. Related to this is the continuous ranked probability score, which measures discharge error in the same units as the variable of interest, or meters cubed per second. The optimal value for this is zero, and it's used to assess the magnitude of the errors in the EFAS forecast compared to the benchmark. We also have the continuous ranked probability skill score, and this measures the improvement over the benchmark forecast. The optimal value is one, which indicates a perfect forecast, and we also have this dashed line in EFAS to indicate the threshold value of 0 0.5 which indicates that the EFAS forecast provides 50% less error than the benchmark forecast. A value below zero indicates that the EFAS forecast is less skillful than the benchmark. After we've checked all these other aspects, we might want to determine the area of validity. One downside to the reporting points layers is that they don't show the spatial area that's affected by a flood. So we have the flood probability persistence layer, and with this, it shows the probability and severity where floods are forecasted on the model river network. This combines the total exceedance probabilities averaged from the two most recent forecast runs. For flash flooding, we have a similar layer called the ERIC affected area layer, and this shows the flash flood probability and severity for the model drainage area upstream of a flash flood reporting point. It's also good to assess the expected consequences of a flood. And with this, we have the rapid impact assessment layer, which provides the possible impact of floods on population, land use, and infrastructure 
and it's summarized according to this matrix in the bottom right. There's also the landslide susceptibility layer, which provides the spatial likelihood of landslide occurrence, and the rapid flood mapping layer, which can be used to estimate the flood extent for a forecasted flood magnitude. And a handy feature with this is that you can export this layer as a shape file, so you can compare it to other geospatial information that you might have. And then a final layer that we wanted to highlight was the social media activity layers that are really new. So these use machine learning to aggregate information about tweets regarding flooding in the area. And then administrative regions are symbolized according to the relevance of tweets. And the links to the top five most relevant tweets are included. So this can help us identify the evidence of real-time impacts. Now we'll talk about some EFS partner benefits. One of the main benefits of being an EFS partner is that you receive the EFS notifications. So you will receive the flood and flash flood notifications for high probability events. You also receive access to the EFS IS layers for analyzing developing events. And this is useful so you can follow up on an event and make informed decisions. Another benefit is that you can help to improve the EFS service. So by being a partner, you can provide feedback for EFS notifications and missed events, and also report bugs they might experience in the map view and other services. Finally, you get access to events and training. So you can participate in webinars like today's. You can also request EFS partner trainings, which are one-day trainings for individual EFS partners. And you have the right to attend the annual EFS meeting, which is a meeting for all EFS partners to receive, for example, updates on new project developments. The next EFS annual meeting will be in September in Germany. For further information, you can go to the website here, www.efus.eu or send us an email at info at